Hello, and welcome to the Celebration Church Podcast. We are a faith-filled, family-focused church located in Lakeville, Minnesota. In a moment, you will hear a sermon from one of our pastors. We hope that you enjoy and grow closer to God through these messages. And now, for a message from our lead pastor, Derek Ross. Amen. Well, good morning. It's great to see you. Uh, welcome to those watching, worshiping online. Um, my voice is not doing so well. I was kind of sick all week. And uh, some people said, do you think you had COVID? I said, nope, because I didn't take a test, so it can't be COVID. <laughs> it's very simple. That's how you don't catch COVID. You just don't take a test. It's, it's mandated. It's the way it is. So it's, uh, I don't have a fever, and here we go. But uh, uh, thanks for your prayers and keep on praying for your pastor. Last week, uh, Dr. Darnell gave us a great kickoff to our prayer series. And uh, how many people are thankful help is coming? Yeah. Amen. And so here we are, we're continuing on. Uh, beginning of the year, just a little review for those that maybe weren't with us at the beginning of the year. We always start the year with 21 days of prayer and fasting. And uh, message series really became our theme for the year. Uh, The word aduth, God, do it again with the same power and authority. That's what happens when we give testimony, when we testify. We're declaring not just what he did in our life, but that we're actually saying, God, we're asking you to do it again with the same power and authority. And then that went into a battle ready from Ephesians chapter six on the armor of God. And I can't remember, although I'm always, I might say this every year, but I can't remember a more prophetic start to a year uh, than this one with uh, Aduth and Battle Ready. We've been seeing people miraculously healed throughout the year. Supernatural September was kind of a, a tie back to Aduth. As I've seen the supernatural power of God mark my life, we've been receiving testimonies. I'll share another one here today. I got another email, a couple emails this week, actually, even while I was out of town. Uh, of God coming through in great ways, Uh, miracle pregnancies, uh, financial savings in the tens of thousands of dollars, and the list just goes on and on, Um, because it's not just when we're in an A-Dude or Supernatural September series, right? This is what God wants to do, I believe, every day of our lives for his children, that he's got good gifts for us, and uh, we're open to receive them, amen? Seven people are open. Okay, that's all right. We'll just take your double door uh, portion of that. That'll be great. Ephesians 6 was the Battle Ready series, and um, I think that was right on time. We've, we talked about being strong enough to stand right against the powers of darkness in spiritual warfare by utilizing the whole armor of God. Hopefully you can remember the belt of truth, the breastplate, breastplate of righteousness, shoes of peace, shield of faith, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Um, uh, As we continue to push back the darkness um, and shine the light of Christ into every dark place in our land, how many people know we've been experiencing resistance from the enemy? Because he's not going to release territory lightly that he's been occupying even though it didn't belong to him, he's been there and he's not given it up lightly. So, you know, we, but we don't have to be scared of those things. We, we know that greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. We're not worried when we turn the corner. We're not worried about every shadow. We're not worried at all because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We're aware of what's going on. We know we're wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against those evil principalities, but we know who wins. We do because we are with him. And uh, that series could have gone a lot longer. I didn't run out of things to say. I just ran out of weeks to say them because I took us right up to Easter. And I wasn't sure if I was going to be the first pastor ever on Easter to preach, you know, not about the death and resurrection of Jesus. I felt like that was not the year to try that trend. And so uh, we switched, went to Easter and then things have have gone on. But uh, I felt a, a drawing in my spirit to return back to Ephesians chapter six in this season uh, that we're in. The following verse after all the armor of God is Ephesians chapter six, verse 18. And I read it every week in that series, but I didn't get a chance to preach on it. And so we're going to do that for the next three weeks, talking about praying in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer requests and uh, keep on praying for all of God's people. So I'm going to talk about that for the next three weeks. Weeks Now, many people have asked me, well, pastor, when are you going to tell us who to vote for? Hmm. 
and I'm, I'm not. So thanks for being here. But um, I will make some comments. Uh, I, I say that like, you know, kind of funny, but definitely true. Um, I, I definitely think you should vote if you are legally allowed to do so. If you're not, don't join in anybody else, you know, but like... <laughs> Um, but this series will be about prayer. I'll probably mention things uh, as we go, but allow me to make some pastoral comments in regards to the upcoming election. I do think it's important. Uh, we know that elections do have consequences. And so uh, let me just make some comments and I'll get to preaching. But I know a lot of people right now are very consumed with what's gonna happen. And a lot of Christians are living in fear and don't do that. Um, if you thought you were coming for a sermon to uh, demonize or, or to say, you know, if you vote for a Democrat, you're going to hell, or if you don't vote for Trump, you can't go to heaven, um, Google that. Uh, that'll save you the time. That, I'm not going to preach that message. I won't regurgitate that, which you've probably already watched online. There's plenty of those available to you if you'd like to confirm your preconceived biases. feel a little bit more free in this service. The first service, uh, my throat was just not quite anyway. So here we go. But uh, I do find it comical. Well, not comical. I find it sad. Uh, I've heard sermons from seeing instances. I've got a white pastor friend in Arizona that had uh, a high ranking Republican candidate at his church. Then I got an African-American black friend, pastors in the DC area. He had a black Democrat at his church and Everybody's saying, you know, if you don't vote for this person, you're going to go to hell. And, um, or if you don't vote in an election, you can't be a Christian. You know, you, have you heard those kind of things? Uh, which I find interesting because my sister-in-law lived here in America uh, with a green card from Germany for a bunch of years. And so thankfully she became a citizen. So now she too should, can go to heaven. But for a while... <laughs> She wasn't able to vote in the elections. And if Jesus had come back, straight to hell. Um, <laughs> you know, again, I, you ought to participate. You ought to be involved. But just remember, um, Romans 10, 9 says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus, the Lord, you'll be saved. There was nothing about an American election in 2024 in the Bible. Now, we, we have a responsibility to participate, and I'm all for that. But let's please Stop short of something that's so common these days to say you can't be a Christian if you do or don't fill in the blank. Because friends, somebody has to be wrong. And I'm just somebody that knows, uh, I'm friends with pastors that have preached differently on this. And uh, anyway, I remind you, I, I heard one guy say this, it's true, your vote is not a valentine. Right? Because some people are like, I don't like any of them join the crew. But the point is, you're not trying to marry these people. You don't have to say, be mine. You just have to say, be my elected official, right? It's a little bit different. It's important to be reminded. I don't know, you know, I'm not sure how much telling you to vote for one person will really change anything in Minnesota anyway. So I'm not sure about that either. But here's what I do know. In an effort to avoid political idolatry, I think in America, many Christians have become uh, political pacifists. Right? So we've got tens of millions of evangelicals that didn't vote in the last election, which I just find uh, interesting. Again, I'm not saying you can't go to heaven if you don't do that, but you might not enjoy earth if you don't. Right? It, it doesn't cost you anything. You already pay your taxes. Feel free to take advantage of the vote that you pay a lot of money for. You already pay for it. Might as well take advantage of it. Both of those things are suboptimal, whether political idolatry or political passivity. Um, I do think it's an awesome privilege that we have to participate in the governance of our nation by voting. However, I think it's sad that too many people, no one in this service I know, but the other service was filled with them, too many people that focus only on the presidential election and not nearly enough research is done on local positions such as school boards. Right, which I could tell you my wife, if you're around, you know this, my wife is very involved with the local elections and school board, as I was working on this sermon yesterday, her and our oldest daughter were out door knocking and doing those kind of things, right? Get informed, be informed, get involved, all that kind of stuff. But uh, I think our school boards probably have a bigger impact on the daily lives of our kids than who's in the White House. Because the truth is there's a lot of days nobody's in the White House. That's true. I wasn't even a joke. I'm smiling because I kind of made myself laugh when I said it, but... 
that's, that's just, I'm just saying, right? So uh, whatever. Um, it, let me just talk to us, evangelicals. That's whether you know it or not, that, that's who we are, evangelicals. Lifeway did a survey uh, this past week about evangelicals, about us, because I think there's a lot of yelling and shouting about things. And let me, I just want to show it to you so that we can all see it. These are responses that evangelicals, people like you and me, gave about what candidate characteristic will determine how evangelicals vote for president. Number one was money. Now, I remind you, this isn't a Democrat or Republican survey. This isn't uh, people out there. This is people within the confines of evangelicalism. People who claim at least somewhat to be a follower of Jesus. The number one answer on the board is money is our God. Number two, immigration, safety involved with it. Number three, national security. All the way to number four is religious freedom. We would rather be rich than be able to worship God. Not we, the people who answered the survey. Less than half think abortion's an important issue. Of evangelicals, not of Americans. Character, hardly more than a third. Size and role of government, Supreme Court nominees, racial injustice, climate change. Interesting list from us. So typically I would say, I hope you vote your values. I'm not so sure I want evangelicals to vote their values. You want me to get back to the Bible. I'm about to, but now I'm meddling. <laughs> Make no mistake about it, friends. I'm deeply disturbed about the current state and trajectory of our nation. Sinfulness and societal insanity seem to be at an all-time high. So I'm praying we see all that change. And elections can be part of that. But remember, Jesus is not on the ballot sheet. He is sitting on the throne <laughs> and our king is not subject to a popular vote or even an electoral one for he is the king of kings and lord of lords who was and is and is to come. So get out and vote. If you need to register, do it. I'm encouraging you, take advantage of that right that you have earned by paying your taxes, but don't put your hope in your vote because the sun's gonna come up on November 6th and a lot of people are gonna think the world has come to an end. Again, we thought of four years ago and eight years ago and 12 years, like it's just a recurring thing. And one of these days, the sun won't come up. But it, it probably won't be November 6th. It could be, but I just feel like God is not gonna do that to us because I already said the sun will come up on the 6th. Okay, it might happen, I'm just saying. But Jesus will still be on the throne and we'll be in our month of missions focused on bringing the good news of Jesus Christ across the street and around the world, amen? All right, so have some conversations with other people about your voting preferences and that kind of stuff, but don't be blasting online critiques of other people that you just already agree with, all right? Uh, let's go to the word. Ephesians chapter six, verse 18. If you have a Bible, you could turn there. If you're able, let's stand and uh, let's read God's word together. Actually, I'm gonna read it from the screen so that it's nice and big. You can get a note sheet. I got a couple more pages to get to before we get there. We're gonna read this together uh, out loud, which would be very uncomfortable for some of you, but I don't care. <clears throat> I mean, I care about you, but not, anyway, sorry. Ephesians chapter six, verse 18, ready, begin. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So that's what we're gonna be focusing on this month. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we've been given to lift high that mighty and matchless name, of Jesus, we ask Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear what you're saying. Help none of us leave the same, but everybody leave more like you. Meet with your people today, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> of 
grab your note sheet. I'll, I'll get there. You can take some other notes as well. Uh, Dana and I were out in Arizona uh, in the desert this week. It was 108 degrees while we were out there and 54 when we landed back home. <laughs> it's not often that you can have half the temperature and feel awesome about it, but that's what happened uh, for us celebrating our 18th anniversary. We got home Friday night and given the kids some a hot jalapeno cactus candy. To, they like doing taste test challenge when they come home. And so when we come home, we did that. And then they said, dad, what are you preaching on on Sunday? And I said, preaching on prayer. And all of them said, ooh, talk about me. And so I know I, I have a lot of pastor friends around the country. A lot of them are like, oh, my kids hate it when they get mentioned in the thing, but Rosses are built different. We're like, talk about us, you know? So we get it naturally, but uh, I said, you know, I'm talking about prayer. I don't think I can really talk about you guys. That would not be the real point. That's part of the problem of Americans. We think prayer is talking about us instead of with God, you know? And I said, if you can tell me something to tell them that's not about you, I'll share it. So they all thought for a second. It was probably, I said 15 seconds in the first service. It felt like that was probably only five or six seconds. And uh, Maddie, our 15 year old, she just said, we don't pray to inform God we pray to involve God. Come on, wasn't that good? I said, who did you hear that from, you know? Because I'm not gonna lie, I really thought she had heard it from somewhere else. She's like, no, dad, I big-brained it. <laughs> and uh, once I looked up what big-brained means, I was like, wow, way to go, you know? But I thought that framed up this series so well for us. We don't pray to inform God. He already knows. We pray to involve him. We pray to say, God, would you... Be involved in my life and in this situation. Would you not just be my savior, but would you be my Lord? Many have pray, viewed prayer through such a limited lens, merely informing God of our needs and moving on with the business of our day. But there's so much more to prayer than just reciting our needs and moving on. So for the next few weeks, I'll be unpacking uh, this verse, Ephesians 6, 18. Today, talking about the occasions of prayer and next week going over uh, uh, different kinds of prayer. Maybe you've been wondering how in the world could you ever pray for an hour? I'm going to teach you next week on different kinds of prayer in the Bible. And uh, we're going to conclude uh, praying one for another, talking about how do we utilize those gifts with one another. And uh, even before we leave today, we're actually going to get into a smaller group, a couple of people and, and pray one for another for people that are going through different situations. But the verse uh, begins, and I focus on the first eight words today, and pray in the spirit on all occasions. Now, many times when we hear pray in the spirit, we think pray in tongues, pray in that prayer language, but that is not what is being referred to here in this text. The, this pray in the spirit is not saying pray in tongues. Now, that's not to say you shouldn't pray in your prayer language. This isn't to say don't utilize uh, that blessing that God had given to you, but that's just not what this text is referring to, right? Um, pray in the spirit could be better understood as pray in the will of the spirit. We see this throughout different times in scripture, uh, that, that we're not to pray according to our own will. We're not to pray according to the will of a famous person or a political candidate. We wanna pray in the will of the spirit. And, and a lot of times we're like, man, I, I don't know how. Well, here's one thing that I know. Fear is never in the will of the spirit of God. We've got way too many Christians living and praying fear-based prayers. Fear is not there. Don't fall into that trap of the enemy. It says, oh, I'm afraid. Oh, and God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. So he says, pray in the spirit. Pray according to the will of the spirit on all occasions. How many people know there's a lot of different occasions in life? This word, maybe you have a different translation. This was from the NIV, a different translation, but the Greek word there, the original word is kairos. And that is often translated time or season. Here the NIV used the word occasion, but many times it's time or season. Now as Minnesotans, we know the importance of time and seasons. Why? Because seasons change. And you gotta know what season you're in so you can dress accordingly. Sometimes in Minnesota, we have different seasons in the same day. And you gotta know, and you can't just look out the window. You'll see the sun shining. You think it's warm. Nope, it's minus 20, but it's sunny. So you gotta know what season you're in to know what you should wear. 
Same way spiritually, knowing the season can increase the specificity of your prayers. See, we're not just praying these vague general prayers. Oh God, up there, out there, do what you can. No, when we know the season, we can pray with specificity. God, do this in my life and do this in their life. Let me give you a Bible verse that explains this or illustrates this quite clearly. Zechariah 10.1 says, ask the Lord for rain in the springtime. In other words, you'll know what to pray for if you know what season you're in. The problem is many people don't know what season they're in. As we were in discussion with pastors on staff, you know, a, a week ago talking about this, we wondered what are some, some common seasons that we go through? You know, we know uh, in our calendar year, we've got spring, summer, fall, winter, another fall, second winter, right? We, we have a few, but you know, overall we got four, spring, summer, fall, winter. They happen almost every year, um, unless you live in some weird places that don't have seasons. But here we know we get those four seasons every year. And so we are discussing what would be the four most common seasons of need that people find themselves in. You know, right now it's easy to get uh, focused on this little thing that we have called a national election. And we, but how many people know that season will come to pass? Thankfully, uh, right? It's like another month and then maybe we'll debate it through January. I don't know, but I'm just saying that season will come to pass. Some people are in a season of trying to figure out who they should marry. I'm not asking you to raise your hand, but that would be interesting, right? Who all is wondering? Raise your hand, take a look. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so. <laughs> anyway. But you know, the truth is we're praying that that's a season that you don't visit every year. Some of you will get that later. You're driving home. You're like, oh, that's what that meant. Yep. <laughs> right? I can remember when we had three kids under the age of five. How many people know when your kids are little, that's a season that I'm so glad comes to pass. <laughs> Some people are like, it's so great. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. It's not. <laughs> I was talking with this family. They had three under the age of uh, four. And uh, my wife is like, what, what should we say to him? She's like, we sh sh I would tell him, you got to get a hobby. You got to figure out something or whatever. I was like, you just got to get through it. <laughs> She's like, that's not very encouraging. I'm like, it's the truth. <laughs> Give it a few years. Get them all in school. Then you get your life back. You know, but for a couple years, all you do is you feed them, you clean them. And they, it's not awesome. It's not awesome. This is nowhere in my notes. I don't even know what I'm talking about, but <laughs> this is confession. If you're Catholic, you, were, you knew what that was. That was confession. It was good for the soul. Anyway, you, you go through that season. People are like, they see my wife holding these newborn babies that we've had in the church. They're like, oh, does it make you want another one? Nope. <laughs> we give them back now. You know, that's the deal. Okay, so anyway. Uh, so we're talking about seasons that are on repeat. So Pastor Vicente had given me these four seasons or the most frequent categories of needs, prayer requests that people turn in, that we have the joy of praying for at prayer gathering and uh, as pastors and these cards that you could turn in right there on that connector prayer card. You can turn in a prayer request every week and we pray for you. But I wanna teach you how to become more effective in your prayers in these seasons because what I, what I want you to do is understand you don't need, when you are going through a season or you find somebody else is, you don't need to say, well, just wait till Sunday. Hopefully the pastor's there and we can pray for you. This is a moment that you and I, the priesthood of all believers, that we can bring these requests before the Lord in that moment. Now, there is something that happens when we link our faith together, when we gather together with the saints, but we don't want to wait for Sunday to believe for God to intervene. So I want to teach you about that. The first season um, is a physical season, and I don't know what else to do, so I'm going to take this cough drop and pray that this uh, helps. All right, physical season. I won't preach on this season for too long because just a couple weeks ago, I did a whole message on healing hangups and I hope that helped you. And, uh, but this is a season that I think is on repeat. Even if we've been healed in our body, how many people know our body still wears back out? This is a season that we can find ourselves in repeatedly. It's a reality of living in this fallen world. We wear out. 
Our bodies go through ups and downs. And while we ought to take care of our physical temple, no amount of healthy eating can guarantee that no bad thing will happen to us. I often joke that being a vegetarian won't make you live longer. It'll just feel like it because you're going to hate everything you eat. I said I often joke so you can't get offended by that. Offense is a choice. Don't make it. Right? Bad things can happen to the healthiest of people. That's a reality of this world we live in. So many times we're going to find ourselves in this need for physical healing or going through a physical struggle. We're going through this season in life. We get request after request for praying for physical healing here at Celebration. And I love praying for physical healing. Not just because it's a testimony of my life where I've seen God come through time and time again, but I love the faith journey of uh, taking a chance on God and giving him opportunity to do the work right before our very eyes. I just encourage you, if somebody says, hey, will you pray for me? Say, hey, can we just take a moment right now? Don't just say, I'll do it later. Number one, you might forget. I mean, you might not, but the person next to you probably would. You might forget. But if God does a miracle in their life and you're not around, you didn't get to see it. How cool would it be right there in the aisle of the grocery store? You pray and you see God heal a broken bone. All of a sudden, you're like, let's go, God. Right? Because we know we're not the healers, but we are this conduit of bringing his goodness and his grace to other people. What awesome joy that we have to pray for one another. But, you know, praying for good health is nothing new. Sometimes we talk about that a lot. We're like, oh, all the physical problems we have is because of chemicals and things in our nation. That's probably true, but it's not new, right? Let me show you according to scripture. I'm going to give you one verse uh, under each point. So you got Ephesians 6, 18 today. You also have 3 John verse 2. This is what he says. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health. This is not a new need for humans to need good health in our body. Amen. Yep. I know this verse will mess people up these days who think that the amount of suffering in your life is equal to the amount of your spirituality. We're talking about praying in the will of the spirit. What I wanna help you understand in each of these areas, if you wanna pray according to the will of the spirit, I think one of the greatest ways that you can do that is by praying according to the word of God. So many people wonder, oh, I just want to pray according to God's will. If you pray God's word, it's his will. So you can never go wrong praying what the scripture says. And here the apostle John tells us, dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health. So you encounter somebody with a bum leg and a busted ankle, or a broken bone, whatever it is, you don't have to wonder. I wonder if it would be a blessing for them to be healed. Maybe God's punishing them. I wonder why they have the, no, 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 no. You can, if you want to pray according to the will of God, you can pray the word of God. I pray that you may enjoy good health. So before we leave today, Maybe there's a physical need in your life. You're going through one of that season. As we get into some small groups in a few minutes, well, I mean a number of minutes, but before we go, uh, we're gonna pray together. If you, you join us with prayer gathering on Wednesday nights, that'll be a familiar scene for you, but we're gonna pray that everybody before you go would enjoy good health. Four people are excited for that. That's awesome. Number two, relational seasons. I think we receive so many requests for relational needs because every aspect of life impacts our relationships. How many people know if your money's tight, you might have relationship problems? Just kind of wears your patience thin. All of a sudden you snap and you don't know why was that pressure of making the mortgage payment. <clears throat> when you see uh, these political fights, how many people know it causes a strain on our relationships? I can't tell you. Uh, how many times I've heard from pastors all around the country, ah, oh, people quit our church every time there's an election. Well, again, how can you be all things, all people? Come on. Uh, how many people know when your emotions are out of whack, your relationships can struggle? It's just true. So relational needs arise almost anytime something is out of whack in our lives. 
So it shouldn't surprise us in these days of division that we find ourselves in seasons of relational need. Let's go back to 3 John 2. He said, dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health, that's a physical season, and that all may go well with you. I'm pretty certain that all is not going well if your relationships are struggling. Right? But he was praying, let it all go well with you. Have you noticed, even if you have money in your pocket, if your family's always fighting, it's not going well. Somebody like, I'd like to try, but I'm just saying. <laughs> How many people know you can have good health in your body, but if you're lonely, it's not going well. So whatever it is, I'm so thankful that we can pray the will of the spirit by praying the word of God, not only that we would enjoy good health, but that all may go well with us. Now we know in this life we'll have trouble, struggles. Jesus said so. If Jesus told us, we ought to expect it. But one of the blessings of Christian community is praying for one another. And this includes that all may go well with you. Now I know Many of you have recognized this as well. Sometimes it takes a lot of courage to ask for prayer. Yeah. Right? Because we can say these churchy things, oh, I'm doing fine, blessed and highly favored. You know, like, but it takes courage to ask for prayer. The devil lies to you and says you're the only one in need. He wants to keep you silent so you don't get the help you desperately need. Friends, when someone has worked up the courage to ask you for prayer, I want you to hear that they're saying so much more to you than the words that they've said. They're actually saying, I trust you. I don't know of a more spiritually vulnerable or intimate, spiritually intimate thing that you can do than be vulnerable with somebody else and say, hey, I need prayer. So I never take it for granted when somebody says, hey, pastor, Will you pray for me? It may be a routine thing for you. You may have never realized this or, or recognized it, but I'm telling you, friends, when somebody asks you to pray for them, it took a lot of courage for them to work up that request and communicate their trust in you to bring their request to God. So never take it for granted when somebody, never take it lightly when somebody finally says, hey, I need prayer. And let's not be people that betray that trust, right? That's a sacred moment that we're helping facilitate between them and God that we get the joy to bring those requests to the Father. It's a sacred moment that we get to be part of. And I know you can pray on your own, but something happens when we get around other men and women of faith. When you're courageous enough to ask for prayer and then we believe together, something shifts, something happens in the heavenly realms. God begins to change things that we've struggled with for a long time. How many people know when we begin to pray together, hardened hearts can be softened? Come on, how many people know critical spirits can be changed? God can make a way where there seems to be no way. Why? Because we came together. We trusted one another enough to pray to the father who wants to give good gifts to his children. The psalmist said it this way. In Psalm 71, verse 19, your righteousness, God, reaches to the heavens. You who have done great things, who is like you, O oh God? Of course, the answer is no one. But through, though you have made me see troubles, many and bitter, you will restore my life again from the depths of the earth. You will again bring me up. You will increase my honor and comfort me once more. I love that promise being still true for us today. No matter how many troubles you've been through, maybe you've had bitterness and so much hurt, God will come through again. The psalmist said, I haven't had everything go my way. If you felt down on your luck and things being against you, although I've seen trouble, many and bitter, God, you will restore my life again. 
That's what we believe when we gather together in prayer, friends. Not that we're gonna stay in the situation the way it's been, not that we're gonna leave the way we walked into this place, but that we're gonna be changed by the power of God. Oh God, you will restore my life again. That's what we believe when we pray. I'm so thankful for resources and groups and things that we have and prayer counseling deliverance, all these kind of things that we have to help people overcome inner wounds that, are, that have caused these relational needs. But the truth is the magic formula is not the group you sign up for or the class you go through. It's the power of God that is experienced in prayer together. So that's what we're gonna do before we leave today. Maybe you'll be courageous enough to tell someone else, I'm going through a relational struggle, a season that I need the power of God to restore my life again. And we're gonna pray for you today. Number three, it's a financial need, a financial season, financial struggle. Third John uh, verse two in the New King James says, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things. I don't know if you know this or not, but I think it's hard to eliminate your financial situation from prospering in all things. I don't think he said there, I pray that you'd be broke your whole life. So if you wanna know what the will of the Spirit is, you wanna pray according to the word of God, you are well within the will of God to pray the scripture, I pray that you would prosper in all things. Only three people were excited about that because there's been so much abuse when it comes to excess and extreme on this topic. So I mean, I don't even wanna say amen to that because everybody will think I want a private jet. I mean, if you have one, that's fine. Just fly your pastor back so I can skip the security line. (laughs) ND, they were messing with me at TSA. I was like, I'm gonna tell ND. Anyway, that wasn't in my notes, but I'm just saying, okay. Quite frankly, the Apostle John would not have prayed for us to prosper in all things if prospering in all things was bad. Sometimes we need immediate provision. And sometimes we need a plan of action to prevent the immediate need from ever happening again. I've never understood why some people act like every emergency can be avoided. Right? They get a little self-righteous when somebody else is in a time of need. They're like, I can't believe they didn't plan for that. Well, my friends in Asheville that are 500 miles in from Outer Banks, North Carolina that just had a hurricane come through up in the mountains would say there's not every emergency that you can fully plan for. Now, if you run out of the gas on the freeway, feel free to fill up before you leave next time. That's not, you know what I'm saying? So there is some stuff we can plan for, but how many people know? Sometimes life happens and no amount of planning, preparing, living for God changes that reality in this world that we're living in. So emergencies do happen, and it's such a blessing to be part of Christian community to help in your time of need. And then when the emergency's over, it's our responsibility to make a plan to avoid the same emergency the next time. I got a cool testimony uh, last month from the Pet Millers uh, in our church, and it was about this very thing. They had sent it on, uh, Nathan sent it on Double Door Sunday, September 8th, but I wanna go back and read it now. Um, back in 2022, 2022, two and a half years ago, they were facing financial difficulties and we needed urgent roof repairs, he said. And our church generously provided uh, X thousands of dollars to help us complete the work. I, he wrote what it is, but the amount of money is his business, not yours. <clears throat> in 2024, we sold our home. I remember the situation Pastor Dan had told me that they had lost their home insurance because the roof uh, wasn't in good enough condition to have the home insured. And how many people know that's a bad thing because the next thing that happens, you can lose the whole home. And so we are like, you know what? We want to be here for that. So we were able to do it and people help with that. And anyway, in 2024, this year, we sold our home. Unexpectedly due to rate changes, we received 10X what the church gave us from the sale. We realized that God had not only increased our provision, but that 10% of the extra money that we received was the exact amount that we had received in aid from the church. Grateful for this blessing, we were able to give that same amount back to the church, ensuring others could be helped as we once were. 
This experience reinforced our faith in God's faithfulness and the power of community support. How cool is that? Amen. Now, I wanna make sure you don't like walk away going, oh, do we need to give back benevolence? No, 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 it's a gift. But when God comes through, it was their choice to say, you know what, we wanna be a blessing back to other people. And I think that is a joy that we have to be in this community of faith. Now, in a church of our size, and there are many going through a difficult financial season in their lives, especially if you go to the grocery store, you feel it at that moment. But those of us in good season financially have the joy of praying with and helping those in challenging financial times. Because I think most of us can think back to a time in our lives when someone else helped us out. Maybe it was money or maybe it was an opportunity. So this message is not advocating for handouts, but rather helping people up so they can stand on their own feet afterwards. Why? Because we all live according to the laws of sowing and reaping. It's true whether we want to admit it or not, right? A farmer once said, the most significant day for the harvest is the day you plant the seed. When you take something from what you have and you plant it in the ground, our human nature fights this principle. It's really called delayed gratification. This is why most of us would make terrible farmers. Most Americans would not understand taking something and investing it for later. You're like, well, that's judgmental. No, that's what the studies say. Most Americans reach retirement age and they've never set anything aside. Right, that's that delayed gratification, but there's something that happens if we'll put a little bit away over a long period of time. Farmers understand this. If I eat the entire harvest, there'll be no seed to plant for future return. Farmers have a plan. They understand the season. They know when to till the soil. They know when to plant the seed in the ground. They know how much rain they'll need or how much to supplement it with irrigation. They understand seasons when it comes to sowing and reaping. All those costs for their farm is factored into their business plan. Or another way to make it personal for those of us that don't live on a farm, they make a budget. That is not a cuss word. You can say it in church. Let me say this, like the farmer, I believe each of us have a responsibility to do our part. We gotta choose the seed to be planted, we've gotta work the ground, and then we pray for the increase to come from God. If he makes it rain or we need to irrigate, that's fine, but none of those things produce growth. Only God makes things grow, and so we've got to do our part, but then we pray and trust God to come through on his end. So there's good planning, but there is also miraculous provision where people come through. And I know we can so easily shy away from this topic, especially in the upper Midwest with our Norwegian Lutheran backgrounds, but I believe God wants to bless his children financially. I know we shy away from it because lots of other people have perverted it, but we can't deny the reality that time and time again throughout scripture and in our lives, God has provided miraculously for his kids. And there's no shame in admitting, I'm in a tough place financially, would you pray for me? All right, number four, I'm gonna finish and and we are gonna pray for each other. We've planned time so that you don't run out and uh, we're gonna pray together. It's a spiritual need, it's a spiritual season. We get many, many requests on this. Third John 2, dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health. Pray that you'd prosper. Pray that all would go well with you. And look at here, he says, even as your soul is getting along well. So many times we'll ask, how you doing? And we'll answer how our business is doing, how our kids' report cards are, how our football team is doing. We're undefeated, by the way. And yet, there was a book out a number of years ago. I never read it, but the title really intrigued me. And the title was, How's Your Soul? Probably a more important question for us to discern. More than how the stock market's doing. How's our soul? How's how's the spiritual matters of our life? How's our soul? Here, he prays that your soul would get along well. But I think most of us have been through times, perhaps are in them now, where our soul was not getting along well. Where it was a tough time spiritually. 
where we didn't feel like we were hearing from God, when we struggled to open the Bible consistently, maybe we just felt dry spiritually. When we opened the word, it just seems like words on a page. Might have been the Encyclopedia Britannica for all we care. That was the internet before it was out, okay. Some of these kids like encyclopedia. But the truth is probably all of us have been through those spiritually dry seasons before. We all love the high moments, the, the summer camp moments, the, the Sunday morning worship team leading us in song moments, but some days, spiritually speaking, the birds aren't chirping and the grass isn't green anymore. It's just a grind. I know we don't want to admit it. We don't want someone else to think less of us, but we've all been there, friends. Perhaps you've gone through an extended season of spiritual drought and you began to question God altogether. Wonder if faith is even real. Perhaps you felt like giving up and trying something completely different. Friends, desert seasons are drought-stricken seasons. And we've all been there. Maybe you're there right now, feeling like every day is a drought, another day without rain, another week without feeling the presence of the Lord, without receiving help from Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you with a text that I preached from as we began the year. Isaiah chapter 43. It's just as true today as it was at the beginning of the year and was when the word of the Lord was given. Isaiah 43. This is what the Lord says. I mean, people know, it's important to know not just what the pastor says, not what, what, what the head of our house says, but this is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick, Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I think sometimes our English language, whatever our primary language gets in the way of our understanding of these verses, sometimes we hear, forget the former, and we think the previous stuff was bad or wrong. We think we gotta get rid of the old stuff. But the truth is, when we look at this text, God was really doing the old thing in a new way, right? He made a way in the wilderness. He brought streams in the wasteland. Is is parting the Red Sea really any different than making a way in the wilderness? No, it was both the same power. It was really the same miracle, a path for the people of God that they couldn't do on their own. So really, I'm, I'm praying that again. One of the things I love about our prayer gathering every Wednesday night is I tell guests or pastors around the country, it really feels like church when I grew up where people were vulnerable and like, hey, this is what I'm going through. This is what I need prayer for. And we just rally together and we pray for each other. As Pastor Vicente and I keep talking, we're, we're doing our best. We're asking God, would you do the old thing in a new way? We don't want to abandon that which we know has stood the test of time. We're just asking God, would you do the old thing in a new way. You know, it's nothing new for the people of God to go through dry times. You for sure aren't the first one to feel trapped with no way out. So we're just joining, we're taking our place in a long line of folks who have needed God to intervene in their lives in a major way. So that's what we're gonna believe for this morning. We're gonna pray together in agreement. I've finished the preaching and we've got in about a full 10 minutes that we've allocated for this. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna get in groups of uh, three or four. Five would be okay, but three or four is kind of optimal. Let's not go two. Here's why. When you get together, we're gonna pray for these different seasons if someone in your group is going through those. Mathematically, if there's only two of you, you might both be going through the same season and in the same struggle. And then you're like, I don't know, I needed somebody else's faith to help. So that's why we're gonna go for three or four. Five be okay. Does that make sense? If you're bad at math, somebody else in the group will help you. When we get together, team's gonna play and we're gonna pray, like I said, for about these next 10 minutes. And when we're done, Pastor Dan will come and he'll give us our dismissal. But we wanna utilize this time together in this month of prayer to say, here we are in the house of God together. We're praying together with the saints to help you become more effective in your prayers when you leave this place. So when we get together, 
You don't need to give everybody the details of your season. We only have 10 minutes and there's four seasons, okay? There's four or five people, do the math. You gotta keep it short. Don't give everybody all the details. Just let them know, I'm in this season, this is the prayer. Does that make sense? We can increase the specificity of our prayers by simply knowing the season. The power of God is not released by your accurate description of all of your problems. In fact, side note, I don't wanna take up our time to pray, but I think Christians... Uh, could talk about their problems a little bit less because it feels like when they share their prayer requests, they spend more time giving the devil glory for all the problems in their lives. We might as well just get over that and then get right to praying so that God can change it. All right, anyway, that's just a personal thing that I feel. I'm like, stop sharing everything that the devil's doing. Let's get to God. Okay, so if you're able, would you stand uh, to your feet? And we're just gonna move into a couple clumps. I'll pray once and send us on our way. But again, get in groups of three or four and whether you know the person or not, you might need to share your name, that's okay, but, but this is a moment, uh, a place of expressing trust. I'm gonna pray that courage would rise in the room and you'd be able to share your season with somebody else and, and we're gonna pray. And like I said, we've got about the next eight minutes and then Pastor Dan will come. So Father, I pray for your children, young and old, near and far, each and every one, as we pray to you in the middle of these seasons, I pray, let faith arise. May your people be courageous, communicate our trust in one another to share these needs and let faith arise as we pray to you, the only one who can meet every need, can heal every sickness, can free us from everything that's held us back. So Father, hear the prayers of your people in the middle of these seasons, we pray in Jesus' name. Come on, in groups of three or four, right where you are, let's just begin to pray. Let's just begin to pray one for another. Just share what season you're in and let's begin to make our voice heard. Let's begin to pray to the one who hears us is active on our behalf. We hope that you learned something from this message and are able to apply it to your life. If you gave your life to Jesus for the first time or the 10th time, reach out to us on Facebook or email us at info at celebrationchurch.net. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you again next week.